So welcome everybody. So um, it is planning and publicizing a war kitchen. Uh, my name is Banthane uh, Ban Winfrey of Abergavenny, uh, mundanely known as Jennifer Yoxel in the real world. And um, we're happy to have you all join me for this session today. Just wanna share a little bit of background about myself for those who don't know me, uh, cause I know we've got people from all over the known world joining in. Uh, I have participated in the SCA for a little over 20 years. Um, I did take a short sabbatical when my kids were little. I just discovered I was not the greatest um, SCA mom with little children. So we took off some time while my husband would go to war and things like that every year. The children and I would go to Disneyland. <laughs> um, but when they got old, or not old enough to understand it and appreciate it and enjoy it, I, I came back. And when I say short sabbatical, to be honest with you, it was like seven year sabbatical. And I had come back and, and I kind of struggled finding my place. Um, I tried several things and, and just hadn't really found my, what I call my bliss in the SCA. But then about 10 years ago, my friends were all looking for somebody to feed them at an Estrella war. And I thought, well, okay, um, I can cook. Um, war, cooking at war certainly can't be that difficult, right? Okay, I had no idea. I had no idea at all what I was doing. There was just so much that I didn't know. Um, 10 years later though, I, I'm, I can pretty much run a camp kitchen in my sleep. I mean, not, I'm not bragging. I'm, I'm not saying it to be, ooh, look at me, but I've just done it so much and I've perfected my techniques and I found what works for me um, that, it, that it has become very easy. Now, I am not perfect by any means. I'm constantly making changes to improve the experience for myself and for the people that I'm feeding. Um, and so what I really hope you get out of this class, whether you're new to running a camp kitchen or you've been doing it for years, are just some tools and techniques that might make things a little easier for you. Okay, so that's really the scope of the class. Um, as we go through class today, uh, we have four different objectives. Uh, we're gonna look at understanding the basics of menu planning. Then we're going to talk the math piece of it, my least favorite piece by far, but we're going to talk about calcula uh, calculating the kitchen participation cost. Uh, we'll talk about publicizing your camp kitchen, how to let people know that it's happening. Um, and then we're going to go ahead and talk about um, tracking participation. Let's get into our, our very first objective, which is understanding the basics of menu planning. So the, when you think about menu planning, the first thing you want to really determine is, okay, well, what kind of food do you want to serve? Um, do you want to stick with a period menu because you're trying to really recreate that feeling of being in the Middle Ages? Or would you rather prepare a more modern, modern menu? And look, there's no right or wrong answer to that question. It depends on like a lot of factors. How comfortable are you cooking period food? I'm okay at it. <coughs> I'm not the best, but I can look at a a recipe from from you know the Middle Ages and I can do a basic redaction of it and I, I can figure those things out. I wouldn't say it's where I necessarily enjoy cooking the most. However, um, it's a really good skill. It's in particular a really good skill right now. Um, you know, but so you have to say, you know, okay, how comfortable am I cooking period food? Um, what do you enjoy cooking? Like I said, for me, Running a camp kitchen is my SCA bliss. It allows me to give of service to people in a way that honestly makes me just as happy as I'm hopefully making them. Um, you know, and so I like to cook lots of new different things that I've never tried to cook before. I'm not gonna lie, my friends are my guinea pigs. So I'm constantly changing up my camp menus. <laughs> By all means, there are definitely some things where they're like, um, we're going to really need the Guinness and steak pie again. Okay, that comes out almost every Estrella because that's what they, that's what they want. Um, but I enjoy cooking that, right? So you want to, you know, ask yourself that question. What will I enjoy cooking? Um, how much prep time do you have leading up to an event is definitely a question you have to ask yourself, right? Um, am I going to be able to take off two or three days prior to leaving for the, the big war. Maybe it's gonna be, you know, Australia in, in Ainville. It could be Great Western War in, in uh, Kaid. You know, eventually I'd love to run a kitchen um, out for Gulf Wars, um, you know, but that changes the idea of my prep time, okay? 
So you, again, consider how much prep time do I have leading up to that event to get ready for this? Um, that also brings in that question is, is the event close to home or am I traveling a, de a decent difference? <coughs> I, I do a kitchen almost every single year for Great Western War because we've gone to that war, traveled there now for six or seven years in a row, um, but my kitchen is different when I go to Kaid than if I'm home in Aiden Belt. Um, and then finally, one of the questions I always ask myself is, is again, what do the people I'm cooking for prefer? I know I can see it on their faces when I fed them something that has to stay in rotation, <laughs> right? Like I said, um, Guinness and, and steak pie. Um, they're little handheld pies. To be honest with you, I hang out with a lot of rapier fighters and they're like, could you please make those and bring them to the field for us for lunch, please? So I, you know what, they like them, I like making them, I'm always gonna do that for them, um, as long as they keep treating me nice. <laughs> but ask myself, what, what would they like? Because it it's, makes me happy to make them happy. Um, to be honest with you, when, I, when I'm asking myself this question, am I gonna do a period menu, am I gonna do modern menu? I almost always do sort of a hybrid of them. Um, as an example, I have a forest stew recipe um, that while it's not redacted from a period recipe, contains period ingredient, ingredients, right? Um, to be honest with you all, it's a Rachel Ray recipe. <laughs> um, <coughs> I just happened to stumble across it one day online and I looked at it, I'm like, okay, it's got beef in it, beef stock, parsnips, dried cherries. I'm like, well, that's period-esque. And so it's a super easy recipe for me to make. I can make it ahead of time, freeze it in a bag and just do boil a bag on site and everybody really enjoys it. So, um, and, and I do it in, in both small kitchens that I run and the larger camp, camp kitchens that I run because it's easy to reduce or plus up that recipe in a heartbeat. Um, if anybody happens to be interested in that recipe, I will be sharing my email address at the end of the session. Email me, I'm more than happy to send it to you. If you want, I'll even send you the link to the YouTube video. I did a video recently of me cooking it. So, um, but again, it's, it's a mixture of period and modern food in that recipe, and it works out really well when I'm doing a camp or a war kitchen. Does anybody have any questions on like what type of, of questions you wanna ask yourself as you're starting to think about planning your menu? Can I ask a question? Absolutely. Okay, can, can you just stop for a minute and explain sure. to me what, um, a war kitchen is and the value in it. Absolutely. So when I'm thinking about a war kitchen, uh, and, and it, I use the term camp kitchen as well, for me they're interchangeable. But what that means to me is that I'm gonna go out to a society event, and typically it's going to be a camping event, right? And right. so at that camping event, I'm going to need to, um, to have a camp kitchen available. I'm going to have to have certain tools on site. I know I'm more than likely going to have to cook outdoors, right? In reality, I think of it as, look, if we were really in the Middle Ages and I had to feed these guys to send them off to do battle, I am their kitchen. I am their war kitchen. I have to get them ready to do battle. So how, what am I going to cook? What am I going to do to help get them ready to do that? So you are the only cook. Sometimes I am, sometimes I'm not. And you cook for the whole week or whatever it is. You cook for the whole time. I do typically cook for the whole okay. time. Okay, okay, I'm okay. A, I'm a Virgo, I'm that person. I'm gonna control everything. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but that being said, I typically, I actually typically have some helpers. I don't know uh, if, if Roz is on or not. She's, she's been overdoing the So and Woe channel. Um, but um, Lady Roz uh, from the Barony of Grattan Mountain here in Aden Belt is, is sort of like my, uh, my right hand, if you will. Um, she is just amazing. And so a lot of times we will partner together to run a kitchen. Uh, it depends on how many people I'm planning to feed, how many people I will invite in, or, or really, to be honest with you, I'm not going to allow in to the kitchen to, uh, to do the cooking and things of that nature. Um, I believe very seriously, even though I'm, because I'm doing this out in the middle of a field, and I'm trying to recreate the Middle Ages. I am not, however, trying to create botulism or salmonella. 
<laughs> or, and not everyone really understands how to cook in that environment safely. Gotcha. Yeah. And so I, I will invite people in and I will say, Hey, you know what? I know you want to learn this. Come on, come on. Let me, let me teach you. And, and to be honest, several of those people at this point, Roz can run her own camp kitchen. I'm like, go run kitchen. I don't want to run it today. I'm going to go shoot archery all war. You run kitchen this time. Um, but it, so it really just kind of depends on the size and the amount of people I'm, I'm cooking for, how many people I'm going to let in, in, into kitchen to cook. Does that help give you some clarity? Yes, thank you. You're so welcome. Thank you for asking it. So I ask myself these questions, right? And then I kind of start thinking about, okay, well, what kind of, what kind of food then? I'm going to do this hybrid menu for them. What kind of food do I want to cook? So this is an example of um, one of the War Kitchen menus um, that I've used. Um, I'm a big fan of, of, um, of Excel. You're going to figure that out pretty quickly as part of this class. Um, but it can be easily a table in Word or, or WordPress or something of that nature. Um, but for me, it's kind of the easiest way to track uh, my plans for what I'm going to cook in the kitchen. Um, now, this is a menu plan that I offered last Australia War. Um, and in this case, I decided to offer breakfast, lunch, and dinner options. Now, I don't always do that. Sometimes I'm like, you know what, it, it's a three-day war, guys. Um, you can deal with breakfast and lunch yourself in your coolers. I'll make you dinner, right? Uh, it, again, it just depends on how much I'm going to invest in it that war. Because um, I, I want to do other things besides sit in the kitchen all day. I love cooking. I think it's great. I have tons of fun doing it. But I also like to shoot archery and go watch the rapier fighters and go take mm -hmm. classes and do all those things. So I try to sort of plan my kitchen in a way and plan my menu in a way that's also going to though allow me to enjoy my, my event. Um, the kitchen I offered uh, for Last Estrella, um, I tried to make it fairly basic in the menu because we were prepared to serve up to 40 people. Um, there were four of us um, that were committed to helping in kitchen. Um, I was not going to meet, be the main kitchen person. I was just helping kind of with planning and publicizing and, and there to help make it um, on site because I was kind of in teacher mode, teaching someone day how to run a camp kitchen. But, um, you know, 40 people, that's a lot, right? And if you figure that puts it at a ratio of about one cook, if you will, per 10 people, that's a pretty good ratio I have figured out. So, um but in this case, again, we were doing um, Tuesday dinner through Sunday lunch. Um, <coughs> you'll see a lot of the things on here could be prepared ahead of time, right? Um, to be honest with you, I make those breakfast burritos, wrap them in some parchment paper, put them in some foil, toss them in the freezer. I warm them up in my camp oven the morning of, because I don't know about you, I don't want to get up at six o'clock in the morning and start cooking for people. I may not have come in from the party until two o'clock in the morning. So, you know, I, I think about those things too when I start to plan those menus. Um, you know, dinner was pretty basic. Um, you know, chili and cornbread, that's super easy to warm up. Uh, stroganoff over those egg noodles. The stroganoff I could make before and have, again, frozen in a bag, sitting in the cooler. The egg noodles are simple enough to do on site. Um, it, it took me maybe like 45 minutes to get that dinner ready and on the table. So, um, so it's a, it's a good way to think about that as you're planning your menu. Um, when we look at um, the next one, uh, I ran a much smaller kitchen for Australia of 2019. Um, offering for that, I maxed out at 15. And, and to be honest with you, it was just me and Roz running the kitchen. Um, it ended up working out well because, to be honest with you, that was the, uh, you know, the great Australia war where we all about drowned ourselves in the mud. So <coughs> I was very glad I had, I must have sensed it coming and ran a very small kitchen. Um, but, you know, nice, easy, simple things to be able to do. Um, you'll notice a, a common theme here, um, whether you look at the menu that was for a large group or the menu for a small group, there's there's sort of a theme. You'll notice like Thursday, Friday night, it's stuff that's very carb heavy. Well, I wanna, I wanna do that in my menu because Thursday night, 
Friday night. Okay, that means on Friday and Saturday during the daytime, a lot of people are going to be out doing armored combat, fighting rapiers, shooting archery, going to the thrown weapons range, running all over the place to go to classes. And so those activities all take an abundance of energy. I'm gonna carb people up the night before so they can get through the next day without falling down, okay? Um, you know, I'll be honest with you, my, my fighter friends taught me that. They're like, hey, can we get some pasta Friday night so we're all ready to fight Saturday morning? Absolutely, we can do that. Um, and, and to be honest with you also, Friday, Saturday night dinners, I try to make them kind of full of carbs and fatty foods because a lot of people are gonna go wanna go out and party on those nights. I'm gonna fill them up with things that are gonna soak up that alcohol if I know they're gonna be out drinking. So I just kind of try to take people care of people in that way. Um, the other thing you'll notice on both those menus that my lunches every single day, it's sandwiches, chips, and snacks. Boom, sandwiches, chips, and snacks. It's kind of boring, right? Here's the deal. It's because I don't really, except for purchasing the things, I don't take ownership of that meal. I will purchase the things. I will keep the things um, you know, safe on site. The, first, the cold things will be rain cold for you. Um, you know, I will ration things out to make sure there's plenty of food to go the entire war. Um, but what I typically do is during breakfast, I have a separate cooler that has all of the lunch things in it. And I have a stack of paper bags next to it. And I'm like, there you go. There's all your lunch stuff. Make your sandwich, pick your chips, put your snack in there and go off about your day. Um, accomplishes two really great things. One, Kitchen staff doesn't have to be there during lunchtime. We can be off having fun doing other things, right? I can be on the archery field. Um, second thing is no matter who the person or where that person is when their lunch rolls around and they're hungry, they've got their food already with them. They don't have to schlep all the way back to camp to go get lunch, okay? Um, so we found it works out really well that way. Um, I will tell you, if we're doing a, a small kitchen, Roz and I did this for the 2019 Estrella, um, dinner the night before, we gave them little order forms that said, tell us what bread you want, what kind of meat, what kind of cheese, do you want mayonnaise, mustard, what, you know, what do you want on your sandwich, what kind of chips, what kind of snack. And after dinner, she and I hung out in the kitchen together and put together all of their little lunches and packed them for them. And that way in the morning, when they were done with breakfast, all they had to do was swing by the kitchen, grab their bag and go off about their day. It was, it was actually so much fun because she and I talked about our day while we were doing that, right? We, we were gossipy because that's what we do. Um, but we, we had a blast doing that. And, and to be honest with you, it got to be so much fun. Like we were drawing things on people's bags, right? The, the, our mods all got little mod symbols on their paper bag. <laughs> to take with them for their lunch so it was it was a lot of fun um but when you get down to it right all of that all of those choices all those things we like doing all go into just planning the menu for the ki camp kitchen right so that's what the planning a menu looks like so what questions do you have about planning your menu before we move on I think I saw somebody in the chat section asking oh. about um, food restrictions. So from a food res uh, restriction, um, I I'm, I'm typically, la, la, la. I am flexible, but not to the point where I'm going to make separate meals for everyone. Um, so for example, um, to be honest with you, I am currently on Weight Watchers. I am making myself very specific types of food. I am counting points. I am measuring my meals. I'm doing all of this thing. So, you know, this, um, this awesome menu from Last Australia 2020, I ate none of it. Nada, <laughs> nothing. I, I was like, I can't eat, I can't eat that. I can't eat any of that, right? Um, and, and so I was like, so I'll help you plan it and everything. I'll even help you cook it. Like I'll help you with the prep work but I'm not eating that on site because I'm going to be over here eating my nice little pre-cooked measured meal and looking lovingly at everything you have made. Um, right. So, so, you know, that's a thing. Now I will tell you for most meals, what I will do is provide a vegetarian option because it is such a prevalent um, part of our society at this point. 
that, and I know that many of the people I cook for do uh, vegetarian diets. I, and it's easy enough for me, right? If I do, uh, say for example, if I do uh, Guinness steak pies, I can do a vegetarian version of that. I go out, I get myself some Boca crumble, and instead of the steak pie, they're gonna get a Boca crumble pie. But pretty much everything else is the same because I use like a vegetarian stock when I do it. And, and you know, in other words, it's kind of chocked full of veggies. Um, I have to be careful sometimes if I know that um, someone in my kitchen is vegan, because you're talking about a lot more than alternatives you're having to use. You're having to now use vegan cheeses and things of that nature. And now we get expensive. And so I, I don't typically make the adaption for that. That I'm like, I, I, you know, I'm sorry. I have some things that you could probably eat, but, um, but I, I, I'm not gonna make that many adaptions. And again, I'm not gonna cook totally separate meals for one person. Um, the prep time honestly just generally doesn't provide itself um, in that way. Um, and there's, you know, there's only so much time in my life. So that's kind of how I feel about adapting to, uh, to, to food restrictions. Um, by all means, if I know someone is allergic to something, I'll try to keep it out of the menu. Um, I have a, my best friend, as a matter of fact, is actually allergic to onions. So he doesn't ask me to keep it out of what I'm cooking, but, but when he participates in kitchen, nothing is small dice when it comes to an onion. It is big, rough, chopped onion, so he can just pick it out and not ingest it. It can be in the food he eats, he just can't eat the onion itself. And so I know that, and so I make that adaptation for it. That's an easy enough adaptation to make. Um, I will tell you just from a general uh, course, I am willing to share any of my recipes with anyone. Um, uh, I, like seriously, my forest stew recipe is all over this kingdom. So, because <laughs> um, uh, I've made adaptations to it, even though it's based off of Rachel Ray, I've changed it so it's become more and more period food over time. Um, so yeah, I do commonly share those. If you guys uh, are interested, um, I, I do a lot of cooking videos um, uh, for SEA Food on my Facebook page. Um, I also have a YouTube channel called, that has just started in the last few weeks called Gwenny TV. Um, if you go look on there currently, there's a couple of videos. I did one of the four stew and I did one of the of a Roman feast I did for Easter last week. And when you're planning your menu, how much do you think to do pre-camp versus at camp? That's such a great question. Man, I will tell you, I do as much pre-work as I can. So let me go ahead. One of the questions we just got asked was calculating the kitchen participation cost. I will tell you, when you first announce you're going to have a war kitchen or a camp kitchen, the first question out of somebody's mouth is almost always, how much? And I totally understand it, right? If you figure, you know, we have a finite, no matter who we are, no matter how much it is, we all have a finite amount of, of monetary resources to play this game. So, you know, the, the menu I plan out cost really for me, before I publicize it, I have the menu planned out, I have the cost ready to post in the initial offering because I wanna get ahead of that question because I know it's coming, okay? Um, to project the cost for the participants, I really kind of start, you know, I've got my menu and I'm like, okay, so I'm going to compile a, sh a shopping list of all the ingredients that I'm going to be using for the kitchen. Okay. Now, <clears throat> I don't know about you, but I really hate trying to reduce or increase the size of recipes, right? I'm like, okay, I have this recipe and this recipe says it's going to feed four people but I got to figure out how to make this recipe feed 16 people. Now I have to do math. Well, I am not in the math at all. So I actually, uh, I use a, an online application. It's called Recipe Keeper. I actually just found it on the Microsoft store. It was free, didn't cost me a penny. Um, I like the app because it does several things for me. The first, it allows me to plan my menu, right? So I've got it preloaded with all the different recipes I use in the SCA, whether it's cooking a feast, doing a war kitchen, any of that. And then I just go in and I go, okay, so the event dates are this. I'm gonna offer breakfast. Here's what I'm gonna offer for breakfast that day. Great. Here's what I'm gonna offer for lunch that day. Here's what I'm gonna offer for dinner that day. And I plug all of that in. 
And then the really cool thing is I can then go into those recipes and I click a little button and it generates a shopping list for me. And every time I do that on a recipe onto that shopping list, it starts adding those things up. So if one recipe says I needed two pounds of ground chicken and another recipe said I needed a pound and a half of ground chicken, it adds it together on my shopping list. So I know I need three and a half pounds of ground chicken. Ooh. I know. Nice. So I usually have to calculate it. Yeah. No, I don't play with that game. Now, there are a couple of snags that I found in it, right? So if I'm like, okay, if I put in two pounds of ground, if I click on the, the recipe, say, for, um, for my uh, um, uh, chicken meatballs and wine sauce, um, the way that that is entered for the ground chicken is just a little different than the way it's entered for, say, another recipe. Sometimes it gets a little glitchy, but when I open up the grocery ship, uh, grocery list proper, um, I can fix those little things pretty quickly, print out my list and head to the store. Makes my life so much easier. It has, I will tell you, I've used this now for about the last um, uh, couple of wars, has made my life so, so much easier. Um, the other really cool thing it does for me and that I like better than anything else, it allows me to tell it the scale that I'm going to cook at. So Parmesan encrusted chicken is something I'm gonna be adding soon to um, some of my war kitchens. Um, Cause it's very easy to use. I can actually make it and freeze it ahead of time and then just warm it up really quickly on, on one of the camp griddles and boom, we're ready to go. Um, serving size for my recipe is six. So if I wanna feed 12 people, I go in and I click on the little scale and I go 12 and it's like, oh, you want to make a double recipe? Great. And it fixes the entire recipe for all of my ingredients. Oh, that's awesome. Will, I know. will it use um, just singles or can it do like, like that's serving size of six. Could mm -hmm. it do one and a half to make a serving size of 10? Absolutely. Yep. It's smart enough to know that. And uh, C Star Trimaris was asking, "What do you use to calculate it again?" And so that's that's still the Recipe Keeper app, right? That's the recipe. Yeah, that's the Recipe Keeper app. It is the best app I have found so far, and I've used others. I've bought online ones and and things like that. I mean, I pay for some stuff where I used it a couple of times and went, "Well, that was a waste of twenty five dollars." Um, this one was free. Again, it was just on the Microsoft Store. I went in and I went recipe storage and it was the first thing that popped up for free and i clicked on it it had good ratings and i have fallen in love with it it is my new best friend so uh but yeah so this makes it super easy for me when i start having to think about okay well now i know the amount of ingredient items i need to go purchase from the store right so that's kind of step number one um step number two becomes right Let's say I'm feeding eight people for this war on these dates, okay? I'm doing Thursday, Friday, and Saturday evening, and I'm only doing dinners. That's all I'm doing, okay? I have compiled my grocery list, and to be honest with you, it, ha it allows me to actually even export it to Excel. So I sent it over to Excel, and then I went, all right, let's start breaking this down so I can start thinking about how much this is going to cost people. Now, for the sake of time today, I'm only going to talk about this, this menu from the aspect of what did I need from dairy, grains, and meat to be able to cook this menu. I need four large eggs. Well, I can't just buy four eggs. I wish I could, but I can't. I'm going to have to buy a dozen. And when I break it down, based on the cost of a dozen eggs, it's 19 cents per egg. All right, well, the kitchen's only going to use four of those. Goodness knows, I'll use the other of them at home. It's fine. So 19 cents times four is 76 cents costed to the kitchen. Okay. Uh, three ounces of mozzarella cut into 10 equal pieces. All right. Well, I can't just go buy three ounces of mozzarella. I wish I could, right? I wish I had a cheesemonger I could go down the street and visit, but I don't. I know I'm going to have to go buy eight ounces of cheese and a little block and cut it up. I figured out, I went in and I said, well, how much does eight ounces of that mozzarella cost? I figured out, okay, that amount divided by eight, that's 75 cents per ounce. I'm going to use three ounces of that in my kitchen. Goodness knows I will eat the rest of the mozzarella myself at home. So I'm only 
charging the kitchen $2.25 for the item that's going to go into the recipe. Okay. And I start doing that for everything, everything that I'm going to need. It's a little time consuming. I'm not going to lie to you, but you will thank yourself because you will not under estimate the amount of money it's going to take you to buy food to cook your friends and you will not overestimate that that amount of money it's going to take to feed your friends right when money involved money shouldn't be a guessing game there are going to be times when you're doing the math and it's, it's going to kind of shock you right so for example if i'm looking at these 10 chicken breast halves right Everything in that menu, I have to have 15 pounds of chicken breast. Now, the price per item for that currently in my area is $1.97 a pound. So the price to the kitchen for that, because all 15 pounds are going to the kitchen, $29.55. But keep in mind, I'm feeding eight people, right? So the cost to the per person isn't too bad. So you got to, when you get all of a sudden really big amounts, you can't let it scare you. You got to remember that you're breaking that still down by the per participant. And so that that's going to help. Is this still done within the recipe keeper app? Oh, no, or? this is in Excel. I went over to Excel. Yeah. He exported it. I exported it over into Excel. I, I wish that the recipe keeper would do that. Oh, I wish it would do that. So I could just say, here's, the, here's my zip code. Go in and tell me how much money I just have. <laughs> If I could figure out that algorithm, I would be rich, right? Um, so yeah, so this is this is all in Excel for me in, in math. So, um, so when I when I go through and I, I finish that whole process, right? And that means I need to walk into the store where I'm going to shop, and I need to have about sixty five bucks with me, right? And, and so that's the cost of everything it's going to take for me to prepare these three dinners. That's actually pretty cost effective if you think about it. Um, but I'm not charging everybody in my kitchen $65 a piece. One, for three nights, they would, they would just look at me and go, no, I'm not eating in your kitchen. You're a crazy woman. I'm not paying for your new car, no. <laughs> um, what I have to do is I have to say, okay, that's $65 total for the kitchen. There are eight people buying into the kitchen. Right? That basically works out to be $8 a piece. And if you think about it, that works out to be $2.66 per meal. Now, when people start to go, oh, Jen, it's so expensive. It's, I'm like, um, guys, it's $2.66 per meal. Like, you know what? Unless you're going to go eat off the dollar menu at McDonald's, you can't eat for that. And I'm not even sure you could accomplish that at McDonald's anymore. So I think it's fair. Um, so I, it's part of the reason I do cost analysis when I'm doing this, because in, in reality, people really do not understand how much it costs to do a camp kitchen, right? Um, but when you do it this way and you invest the time in doing it, and to be honest with you, my little, you know, doing this in a spreadsheet for right now, it doesn't really take me a lot of time because I've already built the spreadsheet. I'm more than happy to send anybody who wants it a template um, for it um, with all the formulas and stuff it needs to, to do for you. Um, because again, I wanna make sure that you're breaking even for your kitchen. There are times when maybe I do the cost analysis for a menu and, and for all three of these meals, I've done the full cost analysis for it and it works out to be $15 for all three meals. Total, $15 for the three days. So you're talking $5 a meal, right? You, you can't eat at a restaurant for that amount. But that being said, I know that not that, that sometimes $15 is a struggle for people. Shoot, when I was young and first started the SCA, goodness knows $15 is a struggle for me. I was a poor college student. <laughs> um, and so there are ways that I, I start to look at to say, well, can I, can I reduce this cost? And so we'll, we'll talk about that in a, in a couple minutes. Okay. Um, now, like I said, least favorite part of planning the kitchen for me is calculating the cost for people to buy into kitchen. And, and to be honest, most people, again, just don't understand the full cost of that because it's not just the food. Um, it is the ice I have to buy to keep the food cold. 
it's the propane I have to get to cook your food. Yeah. Oh yeah, by the way, if you don't wanna be doing dishes and I'm not doing your dishes for you, it's the cost of the paper plates and the plastic ware because nobody wants to do dishes when they're at a stray of war, right? That's all extra money. I'm not paying for that out of my pocket. So I have to think about that as I'm planning the cost of kitchen. Um, the other thing is at this point, my kitchen has a two burner stove, three small two burner stoves, a couple of propane gr griddles. As a matter of fact, one's a two burner and one's a three burner. I just got the three burner. I love it. I'm super excited. That is the best investment you can make is a propane griddle. Oh my goodness. It will change your world. Um, uh, 300 gallon coolers, two of which, by the way, are on their last legs. <laughs> um, half a dozen of other coolers of various sizes. Um, I typically keep one for veggies, one for dairy, one for, you know, I use the big ones for all the main frozen stuff. I need to make sure it stays frozen the entire war. Um, couple of boxes of camp equipment, like pots and pans and utensils. Um, Cause to be honest with you, every time something in my kitchen, I'm like, I don't want to use that pot in my kitchen anymore. Oh, but it's still great for a camp kitchen. It goes into that bucket, right? But you know, I, I, I've even got a, a box of just specific drink stuff that includes um, a couple of like some French presses in it for my people who drink coffee. I go on, I got way more stuff than this. To be honest with you, we now own two trailers. It's ridiculous. Um, because of all of my kitchen stuff. However, <laughs> keep in mind, I built up all this stuff. I've accumulated this over years. Well, I will tell you that over time, I wised up. And I started figuring in the cost of replacing this, this stuff and getting the new stuff I need for kitchen into my costs. And people who eat in my kitchen all know that. I'm very upfront with them about it. I'm like, Guys, those two coolers are not going to make it to next Australia. I'm going to have to get a couple of more. So, you know, I need to charge everybody another $2 above, you know, the initial cost for, for kitchen because I got to go get those coolers for next Australia. And, and they're fine doing it because they know they're going to come eat in my kitchen again. Right. So really they're investing in having me be there the next time they want to eat is how I kind of look at it. Um, but I, I do think about how to, you know, costing that into, into the charge for my kitchen. So there's a few different ways to actually be able to do this. Can I ask a quick question that has a little bit to do with the, the prior slides? Oh yeah, absolutely. Um, so I noticed that you're planning this meal in advance and then pro providing them with, hey, here's the total breakdown and everything. Mm -hmm. But what if you end up with people who all say, oh, you know what, we really hate that menu item for that particular day. Or what if you have, for example, a bunch of vegans and some low carb people and some, you know, food allergy people that say, hey, right. I can eat half of these meals, but I can't eat the other half. Do you yeah. make them pay? How do you deal with the costs for these situations where you maybe need to rework something or, or somebody is eating half of the meals? No, I think that's a really great question. Um, so, you know, so here's, here's my thing. It would depend on like, you look, if, if all of a sudden, like half of people buying into kitchen were vegan, I will totally adapt the menu on that. Not a problem. Like not a problem at all, but I'm not going to charge them any extra. That cost gets equally split along across everybody who's going to eat in kitchen because you know what? The non-vegans are going to probably eat that stuff too. Right. Um, but what I do make sure everybody understands is by doing that, right, the cost of me going to get a vegan cheese is more expensive than if I walk into Walmart and get a basic cheddar. But I make sure everybody understands, hey, that means if we're going to do that, guys, cost of kitchen is probably going to go up a little. And they're like, I don't care. I'm fine with that. If you could accommodate us in that way, charge me an extra $2 a day. I don't care. I'm like, okay, great. We're good kind of address that as more like uh, spreading the costs out among everybody in yeah. like a mutually agreeable way. But what if you have like one or two or three people out of like oh. 40 that have no, special snowflake diets? Like I'm yeah. one of those, unfortunately I'm allergic to enough stuff. I have medical stuff. Yeah. Like I typically can eat, you know, three or four of the meals that somebody might provide, but then I have to provide all of my own, but I don't want to pay, you know, for a week's worth of three meals a day when I can only eat four of them. So how might you accommodate something along that line? I think that's a great question. So uh, so I'm gonna give you an example. Last Estrella, uh, not only was I on a special diet, but I, I have a couple of friends who are on keto. Um, very restrictive diet, right? 
And so let me be real clear, that menu I planned for Estrella, not keto by any way, shape or form. <laughs> totally opposite of keto. <laughs> um, and so I said, hey guys, really, it's just the two of you on that diet, on that restrictive diet. I, I gotta consider everybody else in camp. And they were like, okay, we totally understand that. That's fine, we'll bring our own food. Okay, great. Right? Um, I just have a conversation with people and I'm, I'm honest about whether I'm going to be able to accommodate or not. Um, with a 40 person kitchen, I, it's very hard for me to accommodate one or two people, right? Have I worked out special things with people before where I'm like, look, if you're really only eating half of this stuff, fine, just buy, if you're eating the dinners, right? That's great. You're not going to have to pay me for breakfast and lunch because you're not going to eat any of that. Um, it just depends on the size of kitchen. When looking for people with special diets, if I'm running a kitchen, I'm looking at all of the other kitchens that I know of that are being offered. Mm -hmm. And if I know that somebody is going to eat better in that kitchen because they can only eat half of my menu and maybe they're struggling, I send them to another person running kitchen. Yeah. Like, hey, I know that person's doing keto friendly. You should go talk to them. Yeah. And of course, food allergies are different than anything else. I always accommodate for those. Yeah. And for, yeah, from an allergy perspective, I do the best I possibly can to accommodate. Um, there are some, some recipes where I'm like, it's, it's the base of the recipe. I can't really change it. Um, could you eat everything else in the meal? <laughs> right. And if they can, they can. Um, you know, I try to be as accommodating as possible. Again, for me, it boils down to size of the kitchen. Uh, so let's talk about about how I deal with the the dealing with the incidentals, right? So the the cost of wear and tear on my kitchen, and again I've done it in several different ways. Um, I have done it with it's just a fixed surcharge, where I'm like overall cost of the kitchen is fifteen dollars. I'm going to, however, charge everybody seventeen dollars, and because that extra $2 is gonna go into the camp kitty, if you will. And I use that to replace things that are, are breaking in the kitchen, new equipment that's gonna make, you know, the camp experience better for everyone. Um, I used it one year for lighting for the kitchen. So um, I'm like, hey, you guys sick of trying to go into the kitchen and, you know, find the midnight bacon when you wanna cook it? Well, I'm gonna need some light then. And so I used some money and got some lights. Um, so I've done it with, you know, it's just a certain, certain amount. Um, I've also done it with a percentage surcharge. Casey does this, this really well. And I actually think it's a really great idea where it's, um, I got a lot of participants and a whole bunch of them are showing up on different days, right? So like, a, you know, if I'm doing a Gulf War or a, or a Great Western or even Australia here in, in Aidenbelt, um, everybody's showing up at different days. So I'm not going to do a flat surcharge for somebody who's only going to be there for two days as opposed to the person who's going to be there for all week. It doesn't really work out to be fair. Um, so I do it as a percentage of the overall cost for kitchens. So um, if, you know, last Australia ended up being $10 per day per person, right? Somebody signed up for all five days, that's 50 bucks. If I say, okay, there's going to be an additional 15% added to the overall cost to help cover uh, incidentals like ice and propane and kitchen wear and tear, well, that takes their total to $57. It adds $7 to it, right? But keep in mind, I'm cooking for that person Wednesday through Sunday, an entire war. If, say, maybe that a, per a different person was going to show up and they were only going to pay in for Friday through Sunday, Okay, well, their total charge for kitchens thirty four bucks because it's thirty dollars to actually buy into the kitchen plus the surcharge for the incidentals and wear and tear. So um, the the percentage surcharge is is kind of what I've been going with lately. It works out really well. Um, although I will tell you, the tip jar is amazing because people in the SCA are very giving, and when they see you working hard. All of a sudden, they're slipping 20s in your tip jar. <laughs> uh, I love my friends. It's how I bought my camp oven. Um, so I've used that. And, and it, again, it helps to pay for the ice and the propane and, and the upkeep of the kitchen. I put a little sign on the tip jar that says exactly where the money's going to go to. I'm not doing it to make any money. I'm doing it to keep the kitchen running. 
So that's that is that is the goal. Now we kind of we talked about this this idea of well, but what if if the group thinks that the price for kitchen is too expensive? Okay. Um, easiest thing to do is to review the menu and look for items that could be altered or reduced. Um, you know, again, in our previous menu, by far the most expensive item we had was the 15 pounds of chicken breast. Again, I, I want to cook good food. I want to cook with quality. So that price per pound was based off me going over to Butcher Bob, who is a real place, by the way, five minutes from my house, and buying 15 pounds of chicken breast from him. Okay. Um, obviously, it's going to be more expensive than I go to Walmart and get a frozen bag of chicken. Okay, goes from twenty nine fifty five down to twenty two fifty. It's not a huge difference, but it, for somebody who's kind of struggling to go to war and get that experience, it can make a big difference to them, and I recognize that. So, you know, if 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 it's a problem, I hope people will come and talk to me about cost of kitchen and say, hey, we're really kind of struggling with it. Can can you look at it? And I'll look at ways that I can I can pare down what I'm going to use in kitchen, still provide quality, nutritious food at a cost that's effective for people. Okay. Um, and again, like the Casey Joe's example, right? Um, by all means, I I'll do a chili with a ground beef all day long. You want chili with you know brown steak meat? It's going to be more expensive, and the cost per day is going to go up. So. You know, it's 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 those ideas, and and people simply have to decide what they what they want to pay for, and that's totally cool. Again, I totally understand it. I've, you know, um, there are there are times when I'm sometimes even like going, oh gosh, Australia, that's that's a lot of money for food, <laughs> right? And I just I you know I save up to be able to do it, um, you know, and um, but I again I try to balance the needs of everyone in the kitchen and kind of even it out as much as possible. Uh, what other questions do you guys have about calculating the kitchen participation cost before we, we move on to our next topic? Do you decide what the menu is first or do you have, or do you figure out who's going to be in the kitchen first? Oh, that's a really good question. So um, it's a balance for me only because I typically have the same people eat with me as a group over and over and over again. So I will plan my basic menu based off those people. Um, that being said, I, I plan that menu with like, what do I want to eat? When I'm at war, what do I want to eat? Um, what do I want to cook? And it's really menu driven first, right? Is it going to be a cold war? I'm going to do lots of stews, right? Lots of food that's going to keep people warm. In Aden Belt, let me tell you, in the middle of the summer, I do lots of things like Greek, you know, you saw one of them was Greek chicken pitas. It's because I can serve it cold. Like it, it doesn't get heated up, right? It's hot here. <laughs> I want a nice refreshing meal in the evening. Um, so it's menu driven, but those menus have come out of knowing who I cook for over and over again. Does that help? Yes. Okay. Good. There was uh, an additional question thrown into the chat. Uh, do you take into consideration people who are willing to help in the kitchen or do dishes and clean up, et cetera? So, um, so <laughs> I know lots of people who do that, who say, look, I'm going to give you a break on the cost of kitchen if you do dishes. Um, I don't do that. Now, I'm not saying you shouldn't, by all means. It's a great tactic. I know lots of people who, who do that for their kitchens, and that's great. But I personally don't do it for two reasons. One, control freak. How you doing? Um, I need to know my things are clean. I need to know they're well taken care of. Like, and to be honest with you, I made the kind of the joke about people finding their midnight bacon in the kitchen. Nobody's allowed in my kitchen except for myself, my husband, and the people helping me cook. Otherwise, get out. <laughs> um, I'm feeding you. I'm cooking for you. Don't worry about it. You want midnight bacon? Trust me, I make midnight bacon and it gets set out. I will cook it for you. It's fine. But if I get up in the morning and there's grease and stuff all over my griddle, when he's not happy, <laughs> right? Something, something that you might want to touch on on that note that you haven't mentioned, Gwen, um, is the fact that you lay out your kitchen so that there are tables and things between you and the people trying to get into your kitchen so that they cannot invade your space. Oh, yeah, yeah, it is my space, totally. 
Um, and it's part of actually what I talk about in the, the um, alternative class of how to run a kitchen on site is oh. setting up your camp kitchen. Okay. Um, cause I think it's very important cause it's up to your comfort level. There are lots of people I know who are like, I don't care, go in and out of the kitchen all you want. Everything's labeled, do what you need to do. And they're good with that and they're comfortable with it. More power to them. I wish I was that person. I'm just not. Obviously, you've been working with your particular kitchen for a decade plus and yeah. through these people and what they're going to eat. Yeah. So when you're first setting it up, what are some good ideas for getting input from the people rather than just we'll saying, here's the menu I'm going to make, take it or leave it. And like, yeah. let's say half of them hate it. Um, how do you get their input when you're starting? I think that's a great idea. I think that's a great idea. Um, I think there's a couple ways to go about it. Um, if you're going to cook for a household, household meeting, right? Um, whether it's virtual right now, or it's, you know, you guys get to get everybody, get everybody together at somebody's house. Like, okay, so guys, I'm going to, I'm going to start doing kitchen for you guys. I love to cook. I want to feed you. Like, I know a lot of you hate to cook when you're on site. I want to do this. So talk to, let's talk about what kind of things I could do for you in the kitchen. And then I'll go back and do some research and let you know kind of about costs and things and then, and pull it from them, have a conversation. Um, I, I think also a, a great way to do it, and I did this a lot um, when I first started running kitchens, is I sent out um, a poll, right? Um, it was very like, here's a piece of paper, check off the kind of things you want, because you know, it was back in the day. <laughs> but um, it really kind of pre-Facebook poll and all that stuff, but send out a poll <laughs> to people, right? And say, you know, list a whole bunch of stuff, and hey, you guys, you pick what you want the menu to, to include. And then you get all those answers back and you build yourself a menu off of it. And then every, you know, everybody gets a little something they want, right? Um, as much as possible. So those are a couple ways I would probably do it if I, if I was kind of starting from scratch right now. Awesome, thanks. You're welcome. All right, so let's move on. Let's talk a little bit then about uh, publicizing the camp kitchen. And actually I lied, this is actually the, the section that that's in. Um, so, well, most of the people who buy into my war kitchen find out kind of through word of mouth, right? Um, I still have a way to publicize my kitchens. Um, I use Facebook events to do it. I used to do it through email. Um, you know, we have, you know, before, before Facebook was the, was the thing, I would just send out email to everybody I knew, generally like the camp with us, who I knew would want to eat with us and just handle it that way. Um, Facebook has made it that much easier for me because I can create an event for it. Um, and then I can invite people and it, and I leave it open. So that it, well, I should say not always, but most of the time I leave it open. So I'm like, Hey, if you guys know of somebody who needs a place to eat during war, invite them. They're not obligated to participate, but if they want to, now they know about it and they know, you know, what the cost of it is and the menu is and all of those things. Um, so I, I and, and I publicize it as early as I can. Um, as part of this. So I, what I did is I went back, I actually pulled my Facebook event information from Great Western War, where I cooked for a fairly large uh, group of people um, in 2018. I think we did a kitchen of about 15 people, um, which is kind of big if you're traveling from Aitenvelt to Kaid and you got to take your kitchen equipment with you. So um, that, that particular kitchen, I ran it October 2nd, which I think was the Tuesday of opening war through um, October 5th, maybe it wasn't, I think maybe the Wednesday. Um, but I do start in times too, where I'm like, okay, so we're going to start at 6 p.m. on October 2nd, which tells you it starts with dinner on that day, right? I'm going to do it through 6 p.m. on October 5th, which tells you, oh, great, that final day, fabulous, I get breakfast, lunch, and dinner, okay? Um, you know, what's the event going to be at? I generally say what the event is, and then it's Camp Kitchen, and then where it's going to be. In this case, Great Western War, Kingdom of Kaid. Um, as part of that, then, when you're setting up that event in Facebook, it's going to ask you for details, right? So, again, that start and end date and the times for the kitchen, the location information, and then a brief description of the event, right? This one was a private invitation-only camp kitchen, which means I did not allow anybody who participated in this kitchen to invite people into it themselves. I did say, if you know someone who, need, who would like to be part of a camp kitchen, please reach out to me and I'll consider adding them. And I did that because I needed to control the number of people who were going to participate in that kitchen. Because again, I was only taking so much equipment from Aitenbelt 
to Kai, 10 hour drive, pulling the trailer. I try to keep that trailer as light as possible. So, um, so that's why it became invitation only on this particular one. Um, next up, I then generally will add a pinned post. Okay. So my pinned post then is details about the offerings. So my idea was, you know, okay, Camp Kitchens for Great Western 2018, uh, invitation only as I'm keeping it really small. Please don't feel obligated to participate. Just because I invite you to kitchen doesn't mean you have to be in kitchen. It's fine. I understand. There are reasons to do something else. Um, but again, I just wanted to offer something to everybody that I loved. Um, you know, details about it. And then this one, I was like, guys, I'm only doing dinners Tuesday through Friday. Saturday night, it's going to be on your own because Grand Court. So I, I hate trying to cook and serve dinner to people before Grand Court. Because invariably then, I always miss court. And I like going to court. I know it's weird. <laughs> I enjoy court. So, so that's kind of why I made that decision. Um, also, I did not offer anything on the Sunday because we were packing down and getting the heck out of Dodge. So I was like, hey, no meal on Sunday. So people were prepared. They had to deal with taking care of themselves on that day. Um, cost of buying in the kitchen was $5 per person per dinner. Um, I tell them how they can get the money to me. Generally, I'm like, you can bring me the money in person. You can send it to me at this particular address. You could transfer it to me via PayPal. Here's my email, right? I don't, I don't care how you get, the, get it to me, but just get it to me. Um, the menu. Um, I always tell them it's added in a separate post. Uh, sometimes I put it here, sometimes it's a separate post. It, it just really depends um, on how close we are to the event. Um, I, I try not to post the menu too far in advance because stuff can change, right? Um, but yeah, so I, you know, again, just depends on how I do it. Uh, and then uh, I'm like, okay, here's your deadline. Please confirm your participation no later than Friday, September the 21st. Keep in mind, the first day of kitchen is October 2nd. So I'm like, by September 21st, I need to know if you're gonna do this or not, right? Um, and so, I, you know, by that, that time, right, I had a, a, a menu and I costed it out based on the 15 maximum people I knew I wanted to feed, okay? You've made a commitment to me, this money gets to me by X date. If you tell me, let's say that I'm going to start cooking, I'm going to start cooking on the 25th of September, right? And it's all going to go in the freezer so that when I pack for Great Western, it goes into the big, it goes into the big coolers with dry ice and all those things, right? So September 21st, I start, or sorry, excuse me, September 25th, I start cooking. You have until September 25th that morning to tell me you're canceling and not going and not participating in kitchen. Otherwise, I apologize. However, the food has already been purchased and I cannot issue any refunds after this point. Okay. And I'm really clear about that with people as we lead up to the event, right? Hey guys, the deadline is this. Keep in mind, I'm going to start cooking on this date. The last day to request a refund is X date. And, and I, I have had to tell really good friends of mine, I, I understand you can't go now, but I, I cooked four days ago. I already have your food cooked and ready to go. So I cannot issue you a refund. I was very clear about the terms of kitchen before you signed up for it. Right? And I will tell you, most people, because I'm very detailed in my, in the way that I offer it, and I'm, I don't want to say militant. Militant is not the right word, but I'm very specific when I say these are the expectations you can have of my kitchen. So therefore, these are the expectations I have of you, right? I lay that all out for people, and they understand that when they participate in my kitchen. And I've never actually had a problem. Nobody's ever said anything. You'll notice, right? on this particular pinned post, July 1st, October 2nd is the first day of kitchen. <laughs> I started publicizing it July 1st. Um, it was pretty early. And the reason I did it pretty early, to be honest with you, it was an out of kingdom event I was gonna cook at. 
And so I wanted to give people as much leeway as possible, right? I had a lot of people not commit until closer to the date, which is absolutely fine, but this was a way for me to continuously communicate with people and let them know what was going on so they could, by the 21st of December, make a final decision on whether or not they wanted to buy in and send me money. So, um, as part of that though, lots of times then, like I said, I simply add the menu on a later post, okay? Menu details by the day. In this case, I was, again, I was only offering dinners. Um, there are other things I could include in here as well. There have been times where I know I have people who, um, who have specific dietary restrictions, and so I will include an ingredient list as well. I can always send that to them separately if they ask me for it, but if I know of people eating in my kitchen or interested in my kitchen with dietary restrictions, I just send it out with the offering. Um, and then I also generally will indicate, you know, if there are dietary options such as like uh, vegetarian alternatives, I'll indicate that there are vegetarian alternatives available for those days. That way they don't, they don't even have to ask. Um, I also do some reminders, right? So come along about September 13th. I was like, hey guys, just a reminder for those of you eating in kitchen, make sure you have marked yourself going on the invitation. Um, unless we spoke about other arrangements, please note the deadline for paying in the kitchen is approaching as September the 21st. Um, details on the payment is found in the pen post. Just a little poke, a little reminder, hey, just if you're planning on doing it, don't forget these dates. And then I get my launch, what I call my launch post. My, I get to start cooking for you all, right? Um, this one I happened to do uh, the day that I, uh, the morning I, re I think I was getting ready to go to site. So I was like, good morning, super excited. Running kitchen is my favorite way to take care of you all. And then I gave them details about, about that they should know about kitchen, right? So dinner every evening is going to be served between 5.45 and 6. Um, it's going to remain out and warm for an hour. Uh, like I said, I've got little warming trays and stuff like that to help me with it. Uh, won't be available during that time frame. Just let me know and I will set food aside for you. Um, I'll just, I'll put it on a plate, put some foil around it, stick it in the camp oven. It, it'll typically keep it warm. Um, and if not, I can reheat it for them really quick when they get back if I'm around. If not, mostly people just kind of grab it and they don't care. They knew they were going to be late anyway. So they're just happy the food was there when they got back. Um, in this particular case, I, uh, I made paper plates and plastic utensils available for their use. Um, I, you know, they're totally welcome to use their own, their own feast gear, but no washing station was available. Again, I was schlepping all the way over to Kaid. I was not taking all my camp washing stuff with me, except for what I needed to, to clean my cooking equipment. Um, I let them know who was helping me. Inea of Aitenvelt actually helped me um, run that kitchen. Uh, it was our first time working together, and I had lots of fun with her. Um, Casey Joe, uh, Roz also uh, pitched in as well and helped me kind of keep my sanity that war. There was a lot going on, I'm not kidding. Um, and I just remind people that look, they are an extension of me and they work just as hard as I do to make sure everybody's well fed and to thank them when they see them. Because a lot of times, sometimes people just come by and grab their food and go on about their way and all I want is really a thank you. So. Uh, so I kind of remind them uh, to thank my, my staff as well, if you will. Um, so that's how I publicize my camp kitchen. Again, there's no perfect way to do it. I just happen to use Facebook. It's become the most easy way for me to communicate to people. Uh, any questions you have on that? When you talk about um, your kitchen crew and such, um, when uh, granted Great Western War obviously was a very dry kitchen. Yes. But do you get um, people signed up to fetch water or take out the trash, things like that? Yeah, it kind of depends. Uh, again, it depends on like, to, to be honest, it depends on like how many people I have doing kitchen. Um, to be honest with you, I, I usually my, my, uh, my son and my husband both go to wars with me all the time. And I just look at them each evening and go, go take out the trash. <laughs> right? Um, <laughs> And, you know, or go get the water for me really quick. So, uh, so you know, for me, I just kind of, you know, handle it as a case-by-case -case basis. Um, the people I camp with and who usually eat in my kitchens, I don't normally have to have them sign up for anything because they'll just be like, hey, can I take the trash out for you? Do you need any water? Let me go get it for you. Um, if I camp with people where I was struggling to get those things done, yeah, I would probably do a sign-up board that was like, okay, who's taking out the trash on this night? Who's going to go get me water on this day? Um, 
but yeah, I'm lucky enough not to have to worry about it. But I know, I do know, I have friends who run kitchens as well that, man, there's a sign up before they get anywhere near site. I'm just, I've just lucked out and never had to do it. Okay. Any other questions before we, we move on to our final topic? What happens if you've got royalty as part of your kitchen? You were saying no meal before grand court. Yeah. Um, I participate in a kitchen on a yearly basis that for many, many times we wind up feeding royalty, baron yeah. baronesses and kings, queens. Yeah, in there. Princess. Yeah. Um, How do you feed them? Yeah, so typically what I will do is I have a separate conversation. I mean, you know, come on. Not that they're, I'm going to treat them different because they're royalty, but I'm going to treat them different because they're royalty. They got jobs to do, like big jobs to do, big unpaid volunteer jobs to do. So, right. um, you know, I'll publish it. I'll publish what I have for the kitchen. And um, the couple of times where I've, I've hosted um, royalty or nobility um, in kitchen, they'll say, hey, could you do me a favor? Could you have something ready for us before we have to run to Grand Court or Kingdom Court? Absolutely, not a problem. Do you mind having some leftovers from Thursday night that I can warm up for you? That would be perfect, thank you. And they're good. Speaking of leftovers, what do you do with on a regular basis? Nice. Um, a lot of times what I'll do is like, so if I have, to be honest with you, it's gotten to the point where I don't really have leftovers because people are like, is, is there any more? And I'm like, here, take, take the thing. Um, but if I do, I will, as quick as I can, double bag it in Ziploc baggies and get it back in, in and let it cool down just a little bit, but then get it into the cool, back into the cooler. A lot of times what I'll do is on a, like a Sunday night is I'll say, okay, Sunday night's leftover night. I warm up all the leftovers and I toss it out and because we're all packing down anyway. And then we just eat the leftovers on Sunday night because I don't want to bring food home. You know, that means I got to hustle and get a cooler out of the trailer and unpack it when I get home at two o'clock in the morning. I don't think so. So, um, so yeah, that's what I typically do with leftovers. Um, okay. Australia War 2019, I had a lot of leftovers because of all the horrible rain and stuff. Yeah, I think I ate meat pies for a week. <laughs> I mean, it wasn't horrible by all means, but um, <laughs> I made 60 of them. I wouldn't complain. <laughs> yeah, camp was like, just keep handing me meat pies. I don't care. <laughs> so, but yeah, so that's typically like, like on a typical, you know, decent, didn't rain like the apocalypse war. Um, <laughs> I just, I get it back into the cooler and, and then I do like, um, you know, um, I do leftover night so I don't have to take it home. We have another question. Um, when you are traveling, uh, do you ever shop once you get to the event or do you always have everything before you leave? So, um, it depends on how far I'm traveling. Um, I did not cook. Let's see. I did not cook pre going to Great Western War 2018 and I wish I would have. Uh, let's just say I didn't pre-cook everything. Um, I had things like I did um I did Philly cheesesteak. The meat was all cooked ahead of time. Um and I, I had you know I froze it and then I got it into the cooler and I kept it cool the whole time. Um it depends on again, kind of goes back to the idea of how long do I have to prep. Um probably from here on out when I do Great Western, nothing gets cooked ahead of time because to be honest with you, I leave the Friday before Great Western and we generally will go to like a concert in LA on Saturday. Um, so we'll like go to the beach on Sunday. I go to Magic Mountain on the Monday and then we go to war on Tuesday. Let me tell you what a hassle that was to get all those coolers in a hotel room and keep everything cold for four days. Not okay. Bad choice on my part. If I wasn't going to do all those things ahead of time, yeah, I'd probably pre-cook and get some dry ice and, and keep it nice and cold and just take off for war and still go with my prep as much as you can before you go. But when we're talking things like bread, um, uh, salad, things of that nature, I wait till I get to where I'm traveling to to purchase those items, right? So anything more perishable um, in nature, I wait until I, I get to my location. 
So I know we're getting kind of short on time. So I'll, I'm going to kind of jump into the, the next section, the final section, which is prep, uh, tracking participation. So tracking participation. So like I said, la this year, the Stray War, um, I camped with Silver Moon in the Barony of Aitenfelt. They are amazing. I love them as a household. <laughs> They're great. Um, you know, with, again, household members, though, and guests from out of kingdom that we were hosting, it was possible we were going to have like 40 people in the kitchen. And that's a lot of people to keep track of. Um, so like I said, you know, spreadsheets are my friend. And so I have an Excel spreadsheet that allows me to track participation. And so, you know, over here, I've got like, what is it? It's an Australia War Kitchen. Great. What are the dates? Oh. Who's the head chef and who's going to help? Um, I love color coding, <laughs> right? I know that Richard is vegetarian. Boom. Yes, he is participating. Yes, he's yellow. They're participating, they're blue. If they're not participating on a particular date, they're red. Once they're paid, I mark them green for paid because the money, right? Um, there's no offering. That day has a totally different color. Um, but it allows me very easily to, at the drop of a hat, figure out who is participating in kitchen and who has paid. And again, I go to the SEA event to have fun. I I do everything I do before the FCA event to have fun, not to drive myself crazy. And so organization is a thing for me. So I want to thank everybody for coming to class. It was um, a great class. Yes. Thank you. Thanks so much.